Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. How's everybody today? Are you blessed and highly flavored? Oh, yes. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice because we have a choice, and we choose it. Turn to your neighbor and say, choose today what is pleasing to God and not to yourself. Oh. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> Glory. I have a message from the Lord. <laughs> Did you ever see that movie by the Veggie Tales? Jonah. And he comes riding in on a camel and he goes, I have a message from the Lord. <laughs> Anyways, if you haven't watched it, I encourage you. It's very encouraging. Anyways. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands to heaven and get another drink. Glory, fill us, fill us, fill us, and fill us, and, and kill us, and fill us. And then fill us more, because we need filling big time. Big time filling, in Jesus' name. Amen. We go for the high premium octane. Amen. Praise God. John chapter 7. We need it. We need nitro from heaven. There's a lot of stuff going on in this world, man. Attacks are everywhere. Well, I'm not being attacked. Well, then you ain't doing something for God. <laughs> Hello? The devil doesn't attack those that are in God's will. He lets them stay there in, in his will. He attacks those who are in God's will. But we are overcomers. We are more than conquerors. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. We can do all things through Christ, the anointing that strengthens us. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We are the righteousness of God. And we're third dimensional warriors. So welcome to Sunday morning training for reigning. John 7, verse 37. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, If anyone what? Thirst. Let him come to me and drink. Do you understand it is essential to always maintain the thirst for God's presence? When you lose the thirst for God's presence, you have drifted and swayed. That means you're thirsty for other things of the world and not the things of God. That's what the enemy always tries to do. He always tries to breach. He causes a breach between us. We find ourselves more involved in the things of the world and concerned in the things of the world than we are the things of God. That means that we're not kingdom-minded, but we must be kingdom-minded in everything. That's why the word says, Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all things will be added. Amen? People keep trying to add their own stuff, and they call it a blessing when God didn't bless it and bring it. And on the last day, Jesus stood up and he said, Listen, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, in this here, he's talking about flowing of rivers of living water, which, of course, is connected to the divine life of God Almighty. It is the flow of himself, this is the flow of himself through us into the world. It is the flow of himself in us into the world. This is called divine flow. Everyone say divine flow. Only those baptized in the Holy Spirit will allow that flow. 
not baptized in the Holy Spirit, that flow is not there. Because people still live by the letter, not by the Spirit. In the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's an area where submission and cooperation with his leading and guidance is essential. This is what we call divine flow. You know when things are flowing. You know it. And you know when they're not. You just know it. In other words, in the river of God, when you're flowing, you're, there's a movement, there's activity. Nothing is clinging to you. There's no attachments. We call it Klingons. There's no Klingons. Hybrids from another realm. Amen? Amen? When there's this flow, it's totally different. What's happening in this divine flow, the heartbeat of God causes the blood of life to flow through our veins. You are now walking in the heartbeat of God. And there's no abstractions. If you look in the physical, your heart is essential to everything. No heart, no life. Amen? And the purpose of the heart is to pump blood through to your veins. That flow is the same thing. If you think about this, this is how God created us. There would be a constant flow. But this is a physical. When the flow of blood stops, you die. Same thing spiritually. When the flow of the river stops, you die. But one of the things that the enemy tries to do is bring distractions. So what people eat will affect their physical body. It begins to clog their arteries. Begins to clog their veins. Because they're eating food that is harmful to their physical body. Well, you can eat food that is harmful to your spiritual body. To the flow of the life, that divine flow. We can eat deceptive food that is bringing harm to us and ab abstracting the flow that God so wants us to. Because in this flow, it's like energy, it's like power. It is the flow of God inside of me and you. Is everybody okay? Oh, hallelujah. In John 15, he explains it a little bit further. Divine flow. No obstructions in our, in our veins. No obstruction to the flow. Open. In verse 1, John 15, verse 1, I am the what? vine and my father is the vine dresser in other words jesus is the vine not just a vine but the vine he is the vine of life to all mankind who's connected to him the vine dresser comes for each vine he nourishes it he prunes it there's an appointed time for each vine. If you look at grapevines. He fertilizes it. He protects it from harm. Until in the vine, there is complete confidence in security and maturity in him. In other words... Jesus came as the example, and he said, I am the vine, and my father is a vine dresser. He, he connected the relationship. The one that was going to prune him so he could bear more fruit. The one that was going to protect him. The one that was going to allow him to be smitten by his father. He would be chastised by his father. He would allow this to happen on the cross. Why? Because 
his death was going to bring life to the rest of us. Is everybody okay? In verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bear fruits, he prunes that it may bear more fruits. Does everybody see it now? The area of the grapevine. The vine, the branches, that's going to produce fruit. The vine doesn't produce fruit. The, the branches does. Does everybody get it? The vine is the flow, and then there's a branch. That it may, that it may bear much fruit. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless what? It abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the what? Branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Does everybody see that we are the branches of the true vine that the fruit must come from? Without that flow. Because vines are almost like veins. Without that flow, there is no production of fruit. All right? Is everybody okay? Okay. In verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is what? He is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. And the Father will be glorified because he is the vine dresser. Oh, hallelujah. Again, Jesus is the vine, not just a vine, but the vine of life. The Father is a vine dresser who cares for each and every one of the vines, nourishes it, prunes it, protects it, fertilizes it, until there is complete confidence, security, and maturity in him. This is where we are. We are established in relationship, in submission, surrender, and trust. When we get to this point, what's happening is this will allow a divine flow of the life of Christ in his branches to bear much fruit. Without that divine flow, there is not fruit. So there must be a place where there is consistently exposing of obstructions. Consistently exposing them that are in our life. Because without that, it will prevent the flow of the life of Christ to flow through us. There won't be a divine flow. See, the enemy tries to tempt us in multiple ways to exchange that and bring abstractions. He tries to get us to eat Twinkies and not good food. Amen? Amen. Matthew 13. Oh, hallelujah. In verse 10. And the disciples came and said to Jesus, why do you speak to others in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand in other words they're not able to believe receive and execute why because their hearts have become hardened or dulled or distracted in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled which says hearing you will hear and shall not what understand and seeing you will see and not perceive this is where perception comes in that's what we talked about a couple 
I don't know, last week or whatever, about false perception. Why? Because ears that don't hear and eyes that don't see. And, and why? The lack of understanding. False perceptions. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. And their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and what? And turn so that I should heal them or free them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, in other words, it is not digested and interpreted, and that can only be done by the Holy Spirit, and that's if your cooperation allows it. Then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who was received by the wayside. Have you ever had the devil steal something from you that took it right out of your memory? Amen. Just took it. Because it wasn't taken. It wasn't taken by faith. It wasn't taken to receive and believe and want to execute it. See, you can take something and put it on the shelf and the wind blows it away. But until you digest it and it truly comes into you, it cannot be stolen because now you're using it. Verse 20. But he who receives seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while because there's truly no foundation. It's been contaminated. It's cracks in the foundation, easily broken and swayed. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately they stumble. They go back to the world. Now he receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes what? Unfruitful. In other words, the enemy has convinced him to exchange it. Just like Esau who sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge. Or stew. Same thing. Verse 23. But he who receives seed on good ground is he who bears the word and understands it. Does everybody see that? He who hears the word and does what? Understands it, is able to digest it, believe it, receive it, execute it, and put it into action. Uses it, doesn't let it sit on the shelf and collect dust, and the wind blows it away. Does everybody got it? who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold and sixtyfold and some thirtyfold. Not seeing, not hearing, not understanding because of lukewarm heart. They've lost the zealous of the, of the Lord. Caused by obstructions in the flow of life. Clogged arteries. Clogged veins. Because of what was digested was what we call junk food. Deceptive food. We call, it's also known as spiritual sin. Sin. Or rebellion is the main one. People don't even know that rebellion is a form of witchcraft. When we rebel against things and not submit according to the ways of God, it brings obstruction, distraction. It causes a, a, a slow of the flow. And there must be a level of flow that we want constantly. It's like, you know what, if you maintain a certain level of speed when you're driving, that's why they have certain areas of the road that's 65, 75, 90, uh, um, oh, wait a minute, 55, whatever it is, you know, um, to where that you can have enough momentum going to go up hills, go around things, whatever it may be. Well, you need to have that flow 
of the river in you so that your momentum is overtaking anything that the enemy tries to put in front of you. Distractions no longer get, they, they get pushed aside. Amen? Divine flow is actually a walk together with the Lord in the Spirit. Knowing the heartbeat of God, the Father, in Jesus, connected by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was a true example of this walk. Something about the divine flow of God always produces loyalty and royalty. There will always be a loyalty and there will be an identity of royalty in the flow of God. What two areas are produced by the flow? Loyalty and what? Royalty. In other words, your identity is maintained in that flow. When that flow begins to get altered, you begin to lose identity also. Because it is life to your spirit, man. And remember, God is trying to flow through us into this realm. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter 1. Verse 2. Is everybody okay? Amen. Okay. Okay. Verse 2, let's speak it. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly and great precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Divine nature is established by the connection to the true vine of Christ, allowing the divine flow of his life in us to be manifested as his offsprings. Without that connection, without that flow, not only do we lose our reality of royalty, we lose loyalty to him. Amen? And, and, and then we begin to lose the area of position where he's placed us in. Again, divine nature is established by the connection to the true vine of Christ, allowing the divine flow of his life in us to be manifested as his offsprings. We are living in a realm, when you're living in this realm, when that flow is there, you are living in a realm of divine impulses and divine appointments. Divine impulses and divine appointments. Everything that you see, no matter how it comes, no matter where it comes from, no matter what's going on, you see God behind it. You see the Lord behind it. Amen? So there's an area where you and I must maintain a level of endurance, a level of consistency, a level of awareness. Three things we must maintain. A level of endurance, a level of consistency, and a level of awareness. This flow is always doing something more in our life. One of the things it's always doing is perfecting his love in us. Because it's a life flow. Is everybody okay? Okay. In 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. That's why we worship. That's why we lift our hands and surrender. You're actually making contact. First John four seventeen. Remember this divine flow 
in this divine nature. You know, God, remember the word says that God is love. God is love. And in this divine flow, there is a love being perfected in us from above. Not a lust that's being perfected, a love. You'll find yourself more and more in love with the Lord. You'll find yourself more and more drifting away from the world. You'll find yourself in an area where nothing can replace him. Nothing. His presence, his voice. Nothing. Verse 17, let's speak it. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Now, can that happen without divine flow? Heck no. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out what? Fear. Isn't fear an obstruction? Boy, it'll clear the flow quickly. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Uh, we loved him because he first loved us. Again, as he is, so are we in this world. We are one in unity in the Spirit. We are a life hidden in Christ. We are eternal beings in a temporary body. In fact, your body can't even handle the presence of God sometimes. That's why it flips around on Can't handle it. Man, when the glory of God hit me in my living room, I looked like a fish out of water. I was a flipping and a flopping. My wife moved the coffee table away. I flew off the coffee table onto the floor. I was doing holy rolling. I knew, I knew where they got the holy roller from. I didn't know what they meant. Right? I was speaking all kinds of languages out of my mouth, every foreign language that there was. And when I finally stopped, I mean, I, it looked like my mom wanted to call 911 at first. You know, she thought I was having convulsions or something. It looked like it. My wife and I just left a revival where we saw it all over the place so we knew what was happening. And I brought home a video. I put it in. I said, look, let's watch this. And man, the first thing I noticed, I said, Lord, that's your glory. And all of a sudden, Whoa! <laughs> boom, I got slam dunked. But in that, sometimes your body can't even handle the presence of God. You'll find yourself starting to shake. Is everybody okay? Yeah. Now, I don't want anybody going around just shaking to shake. Amen? <laughs> That's called flesh shake. We want holy shake. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are life hidden in Christ, eternal beings in a temporary body, expressing the divine nature of Christ by the divine flow of his presence in us. We need to move, remove all obstructions. Amen? Praise God. Galatians 5. That's why the Lord is giving us the ministry of the Spirit because it is the flow of the life of God. We are carriers of the life of God in this realm. Galatians 5, verse 13. Let's speak it. Is everybody there? For you, brethren, have been called to what? Liberty or freedom, but only do not use it, this liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you become consumed by one another. I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so you do not do the things that you wish or carnally desire. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, to walk in the realm of the life of Christ in a divine flow of love and power, we are overcomers. We are overcomers. And we are exposing and removing obstructions in our body, in our life, in that divine nature of Christ Jesus, in that flow. We don't want anything to obstruct it. Do you ever see a, a stream? and There's rocks that are in the stream, right? So the water's got to go around it. Well, it slows up the flow. And we want a clear flow of everything. So we want to remove anything and everything that would interfere with the true vine which brings the divine nature to me and you. Do you ever notice that divine has the word vine in it? Snap. Again, we want to walk in a realm of the life of Christ in a divine flow of life and power, overcoming and exposing and removing obstructions that you know are causing a lack of divine flow. You know what they are. You know that prevents that flow and activity. We know why, because the Holy Spirit has already revealed it to us, but we're refusing to cooperate. We are justifying. Only you and I can allow the stop and flow or distractions and obstructions, the current flow or the divine flow, by allowing corruption, influence, taking hold of the mind, taking hold of the mouth, taking hold of your motives, taking hold of our attitude, hello? All of these things, any part of that that is corrupted, corrupted desires, all of those corrupted things will cause an obstruction in the flow of the river of life in us called the divine flow. In John chapter 1, Oh, happy day. What's in your life that's causing the divine obstruction? I didn't say what's in your wallet. I said what's in your life. And then the other thing you might want to search out is what's in your mirror that's causing it. Verse 1, 1 John Uh, John chapter 1, I'm sorry. John chapter 1. Not 1 John. 0 John chapter 1. <laughs> the gospel of John, not the epistle. Verse 1. We'll read the first four verses. For, for, <laughs> first four verses. <laughs> First four voices, okay. Praise God. Well, this is a voice. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. That's simple enough. People argue over that. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. And the darkness did not comprehend it. A life of darkness under the lust and rule of this earth cannot understand the divine flow of Christ and his anointing. Because since birth, the veils were put on their eyes. Veils or scales on their eyes. Seeing and hearing and understanding is difficult for individuals. We are in a time and season right now where we see many proclaimed to be Christians that are still veiled. I mean, look it up. How many 
political politicians and government and rulers are claiming to be Christians, yet they promote for things that are displeasing to God because they're, they're veiled. And, and that divine flow is no longer in them. They're obstructed. And things are not getting better. They're getting worse. But it's supposed to get worse. Does everybody understand that? Why? Because the worse it gets, the lighter you shine. <laughs> Again, this is going to escalate. Darkness is trying to comprehend. It can't comprehend. It does not interpret. It cannot understand the things of God. It cannot let go of the things that are obstructing them because they get fed by it. In Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 22. Eyes that don't see, ears that don't hear, and a heart that doesn't understand. Keeps a person in bondage. In verse 22, the lamp of the body is the what? The eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of what? Light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of what? Darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? So can light turn to darkness? Yes. Yeah. And he's going to show you how. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money because it becomes an idol. A bad eye. It's light. Then now it becomes darkness. And because they're trying to serve, you know. I, I believe me, and it's not about religious organizations or or, or denominations or whatever, but I keep seeing these individuals up on TV going, I'm a good Catholic. I've been an altar boy. But yes, I'll fight for abortion. I'll fight for gay rights. Oh, he's been drinking the wrong wine. And he's got a blocked artery from God because there's no flow of life there. That's promotion of death. These are wolves in sheep's clothing that don't even know it. Why? Because they can't comprehend it. They don't even know it. They think that they're good people. Well, I'm a good person. So what? Are you a righteous one? There's a difference. Righteousness promotes righteousness. Why? Because righteousness approves everything that God approves of. See, the world is still eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is serpent food. We're supposed to be eating from the tree of life. Life, which is, which allows the divine flow and produces the fruit of righteousness. But they don't get it. One of these days, these, the government is going to turn around and we're, they're going to start to say, what about what God thinks? That's all I see on the news all the time is opinionated stuff. Grumbling and complaining and accusing. But there's no standing up for what God says. But we do have a president that is beginning to stand up for what God says. Amen? But we're to be standing up for what God says. We're to be bringing the life flow of the divine nature of God with his power and love and compassion into this world. Amen? As examples of submission and service to the king. Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. In verse 1. Let's speak it. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but 
For you it is safe. Beware of what? What's a dog? And don't go roof, roof. Because that ain't a dog. It's a demon-possessed individual. That's what a dog is. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in what? Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in your flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of, of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. This is concerning zeal, persecuting the church, the body of Christ, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the what? Of the knowledge of of the knowledge of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, know him and know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The excellent knowledge of Christ by, comes by revelation and illumination. It is released by the Holy Spirit, and it's released through trials, through tribulations, through disappointments, through sufferings, to life issues, to persecutions, and all other forms of attacks from the enemy, that we might know his life in the divine flow of eternity in a loyal form and a royalty form. That we may know who we are in him. See, we get so caught up in all these trials and tribulations and everything else, corrections and everything, and but the Word says, count it all joy. Why? Because if you maintain a joy, you maintain God's presence. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if you're maintaining that arena and you're consistent, you maintain that flow, and in that flow, you're able to overcome everything because you have a momentum going in the Spirit. You have a momentum going in the spirit. There's an active momentum flow that is flowing that no matter what the enemy puts before you, you're able to overcome it, overrun it, and move it out of your way. Other than that, when that momentum begins to slow down, it begins to obstruct. It begins to attach itself to you. And then your life becomes a drag. You begin to drag things. And you're always draining. You're always draining because you're dragging. And you're not cut loose through the anointing so that that flow can continue. Amen? So we are living a constant life of resistance to the evil influence. We're living a constant life of resistance to false justifications, false perceptions, and false humility. We're always resisting these things that the enemy tries to bring on us in that false religious state of being. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Hallelujah. We got about 30 more scriptures left and we'll be done. Amen. I'm only kidding. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Is everybody there? Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. 
Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Holy Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of heart or flesh, that is of the heart. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the what? The new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills and the Spirit brings life. We are the epistle of Christ written by revelation and illumination. And our new, mature, divine nature expressing the flow of Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit of God. We are to be like-minded. Everyone say like-minded. We're to be unified in the mind of Christ as we move, live, and have our being in Him. We are to be unified in the love, holiness, righteousness, and zeal. Holiness, love, holiness, righteousness, and zeal. Why? Because we are changing the atmosphere wherever we go. We are driving out the presence of evil. And we are bringing an atmosphere of holiness and righteousness. See, we need to begin to look at ourselves in this area, not in a prideful or arrogance, but in a humble of who we are in Christ as temples of the living God where rivers of living water are flowing through us in a momentum that we're not stopping. And whatever gets in my way is going to get trumped over. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5. Verse 1. Oh, hallelujah. Let's speak it. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, <clears throat> a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For this we groan, earnestly to desire and to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan and being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home, in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be what? Well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judge seatment of God. You know, I think people lose sight of that. And all the things that's going on in the world right now, all of those proclaiming to be believers have lost sight because of the flow, the, the, the lack, the obstruction or the lack of the flow of the divine nature, divine flow of God's presence, divine flow of life has lo loosed them from the ar arena of reality that they are standing before God now. Now. It's like people don't realize that they're not standing before oh, He doesn't see it. You all just hide behind the pulpit. Or let me shut the door and he doesn't see it. There's really not that reality of connection and that relationship that he sees all, knows all, hears all, and understands all. And nothing is hidden from him. You know, sometimes I just want to yell out to people, you will stand before my father one day, but you're standing before him right now. And it's all being recorded. For we must all appear before the judge seat, judgment seat of Christ 
that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we must persuade men, but we are all well known to God, and I also trust is well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. And I'm going to close at 1 Timothy 1. Divine flow. Don't let anything prevent that flow. It is life to me and you. Life. In verse 3, 1 Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter 1, verse 2. Or, yeah, verse 3. Let's speak it together. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you be, be being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I, now pers I am now persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to what? Stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. Fear but power and love and of a sound mind. Remember, fear is an obstruction. Fear is an obstruction. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Let that divine flow of your presence continue to increase that we may have the momentum to endure all things that come across our path. And Lord, expose any obstructions in our life that is preventing or slowing down this divine flow of life so that your true character through the divine nature can be expressed through each and every one of us, maintaining our connection to the anointing, the truth, power, and presence of God Almighty in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen.